When we got back to Altus uh, Air Force Base uh, from our TDY tour in Thailand, things were pretty rocky at home. Uh, me being gone so much, it was uh, it was hard on on everybody. Nellie Jean was uh, wanting to get a divorce and said she didn't want to be married to somebody that was never home, and, and I, I really can't blame her for that. I had plenty of company to keep me occupied, but I don't know what uh, she didn't have as much, just taking care of Debbie and trying to keep the home front going. But uh, things were, got pretty rocky right then. But just to, just to make it a little more exciting, um, the government told me, said, uh, we're going to send you to Winter Survival School in uh, Spokane, Washington. And I said, well, the war we're fighting is a jungle. Uh, what do I need to go learn how to survive in uh, winter? And they go, well, don't don't worry about that. That's not your problem. We just want you to go uh, in, in to this survival school. So they gave me a plane ticket, and off I went to uh, Spokane, Washington, and uh, got up there. It was like middle of February, and we were right on the Washington State and Canadian border. It was cold and wet, but it was also it warm up just enough almost every day uh, to from the snow to turn into rain. We would be out there in the rain doing whatever they had us doing. And then at night, uh, it would be freezing cold. And, and uh, so it was pretty miserable conditions. But uh, they, part of the survival school was to simulate being a prisoner of war. And that was no fun at all. Uh, what they did, they took us out one night when it was muddy and r- rainy and wet and really cold and windy. and and put us in an environment like we were uh, in a foxhole in Vietnam and had us crawling through the mud and shooting blank bullets. I hope they were blanks at us. And and, uh, when they got all done with that, they said, okay, you're captured. And they took us down below the ground and I never did see what it looked like on the outside, but uh, for the next 36 hours or so, uh, we were in a prisoner of war environment and they would take us from being in a line, questioning us about what we're over there doing and and uh, so forth, see if they get any information out of us because we didn't know anything, so that was hard for them to do. And uh, then when they get through questioning us, they'd put us in a box that was about, it's like a foot locker. You couldn't stand up in it. You could kind of hunch over in it, and uh, but you couldn't sit down in it because it was so narrow and so short and they would put us in there and they had a hole at the bottom of the box and if they caught you crouching down too much they'd take a baton and put it in there and whack you on the shins to make you stand back up again and what the idea was is to deprive us of any sleep and uh, make us uh, feel like we were real prisoners of war. And like I say, they said it was 36 hours. It seemed like about a week to me. If you sit down and crouch down too much while you're in that little box or while they had you in there interrogating you, you didn't, you act like a a smart ass instead of uh, being professional like we were supposed to do. Well, then they'd put you in what they call solitary confinement. And I said, well, you know, I was in a box by myself already. But this box was really small. It was like uh, less than three foot tall and probably two foot square. And uh, and I wasn't real heavy then, but I had to really squeeze to get in there. But that was the the best time that I had was in that solitary confinement because you're you're crouched down so much that you can actually kind of relax and just go to sleep. And, of course, if they caught you doing that, then they'd come over and whack on the box and and wake you up and get you moving again. But that, that went on for like three days, and they, they finally let us out. And, uh, you know, nobody confessed all the sins of the world or anything like that, so we did a pretty good job, all of us. Well, the next trek was like a five-day trek out in the uh, forest. Again, we don't know exactly where we were, but they would give us a map every day, and they would say... You go from point A to point B, and we're going to have people out there looking for you. And if we catch you, then, you know, you may have to go back and do this thing over again. And, of course, the weather was miserable, rainy and wet and cold and snowy. And before they they turned us loose to to go on this, and they put us in two- and three-man teams, they gave us all a live rabbit. And there was probably a 100 of us out there in that group, and everybody was supposed to take the rabbit and kill it and skin it and eat it cook it and eat it well i'm a i like animals and last thing i ever want to do is eat a rabbit 
They also gave us some what they call K-rations. They were canned foods that were used. Most of them we had were late World War II and early Korean War, the dates on the can. So they were good 20-some years old at least. And uh, But they gave us a few cans of those things. And so the first thing I did was I turned around and looked at all these other guys, and they would run off in the woods, and they'd take the rabbit. And watch up, Doc. Try to beat it to death in, on a tree, on the tree trunk, and trying to squeeze his neck. And you could hear these rabbits screaming and crying and all that kind of stuff. I said, man, this is horrible. I can't stand this. So I ran further out into the woods. And I turned my rabbit loose. And I said, run, little bunny. Don't let them guys catch you. And so I went back and, and uh, back to where the, we were starting out our trip. And uh, I said, well, you know, everybody's trying to cook the rabbit and do stuff like that. I, instead of that, I'll, I'll try some of these uh, K rations. So I opened up one of the cans. I forget what it said on the can, but it was, you know, like a 1944 model. And... Uh, took a little my little can opener opened up the can and then I had a little spoon thing and I, I started eating and I said you know this stuff ain't half bad it's a whole lot better than them guys that are trying to eat them dead raw rabbits that uh, they can't seem to cook right and so I ate that can and I said well you know it's pretty good I think I'll have another one and so I opened up another can and I ate that one it didn't taste quite as good as the first one and uh, after as soon as I finished eating that second can I had the urge uh, to to throw it all up, so I ran out in the woods and and I threw up everything I'd eaten for the last week or so, and uh, I went back. I, my body was all cleansed, and I was ready to this uh, for this hike that we were getting ready to go on. So off we went, and in, I never ate another bite of anything. I took the rest of the K rations just for the thought of them, and I I tossed them in a pile, and uh, and off on our little trek we went. And me and this other guy, we we were both, uh, you know, pretty good shape, so we'd march however far we were supposed to go. And when you get to your encampment, which is supposed to be there, you know, before it gets dark, the first thing you're supposed to do is start a fire. Well, everything in that forest was wet. And so you had to dig the bark off pretty darn deep into that tree in order to get enough dry wood to get your flint to work to light it up where you could start a little fire but we managed to successfully get a little fire going it was just so hard to keep it going because of, of all the wood out there was wet you know once you get a little fire started you still got to have some dry wood to uh, to keep it going but we managed to get our clothes dry enough and they gave us these really nice uh, sleeping bags that were that were a really heavy duty and I mean they were light but they really were good and they said first thing you do you know after you get all your clothes dry is you get the rest of your clothes off that's where you're naked and then you climb in your sleeping bag and you sleep and and that worked out pretty good um, you know we didn't have any trouble staying warm and everything all the whole time we were out there all four or five days they only had they had one guy and he was a staff sergeant i just briefly talked to him one time uh he froze to death uh, he they were he was a little overweight and wasn't quite good shape as a lot of us and uh, he got to his encampment and uh, the other guy was trying to start a fire and he said man i'm just so tired he said i can't i can't start no fire i can't do that so he crawled into his uh, sleeping bag soaking wet with his clothes and he didn't wake up the next morning. So they uh, hauled him out of there. And, of course, I made some smart-ass remark. I said, well, you know, since a guy died out here, don't you think it's uh, too cold and too bad a weather for the rest of us to stay? Well, that didn't get too good a response from the sergeant, so we, we stayed. And uh, anyway, finished up that five days, and uh, we, we finished up my, my winter survival school. I graduated. I was so cold the whole time I was out there. It was just amazing how you can survive that kind of weather. But we did it. So I got back on the commercial plane and flew back to Altus. I had lost uh, 14 pounds from the time I left Altus till I got back. So it was a pretty good diet program. The only thing that happened good on that whole trip was on the commercial flight coming back out of uh, Seattle, Washington, one of the stewardesses, looked at me and she said you look like you had a pretty rough time and I explained to her where I was and she says well, why don't you sit up here in first class I said you're a military guy I said we got to take care of our military guys and uh, she brought me one of the first class meals once we got airborne I ate two of those 
because uh, I hadn't eaten anything in, like I say, 10 days or better. And uh, so that was the best part of the whole trip, but that came to an end. I got home. Then we went back in the, the same routine again, pulled an alert, and uh, going to Goose Bay and staying at Altus, and things weren't getting any better at home, so Nellie Jean decided she was going to divorce me, and I love Debbie and, I, and everything, but she's doing everything she can to keep me from seeing her, and then all of a sudden she wants to give her to me when, when I'm getting ready to go fly or do something like that, and I don't have any place where I can take her to, to uh, be safe because what I was doing is was when I had custody of her, uh, once we decided to split up, then I'd, I'd take her down to to meet mom and dad halfway between Fort Worth and Altus, and they'd take her back with her while I was on alert. So a week later when I'd get off alert, then I'd go back to Fort Worth and get to spend four or five days with Debbie. And then and then if I was uh, had a few days I wasn't going to be flying, I'd go ahead and take her back to Altus with me. And if I was going to be doing stuff pretty busy and going back on alert again, I'd just let her stay in Fort Worth. So it was working out pretty good, but uh, Nellie Jean didn't want her down in Fort Worth. She wanted her back up there, so we were having some issues. So that's when I went over to the uh, base personnel office, and I said, uh, I need you to do me a favor. I said, I need you to get me out of here. I said, I need to go to another base. I don't care where you send me. I don't care what I'm doing but I don't want to be doing this anymore. And uh, he said, well, Captain, he says, why don't you uh, give me a couple days and give me a number I can call you, and I'll call you when uh, when we find out what you're going to be doing next. I said, that's great. So I left. He called me back the very next day, and he said, hey, come on over here. I got something for you. And I went over there to the personnel office, and he says, when I walked in the door, he said, Captain, you're going to Vietnam. I said, really, what am I going to be doing? And he said, you're going to fly a fixed-wing gunship. I said, I don't even know what those are. And he said, well, they'll show you that because they're going to have to go to a couple schools before you uh, end up uh, going over there. And it's going to take, you know, six or eight months before uh, before you're actually probably going to be uh, in Vietnam. But he says, that's where you're going. I said, well, okay. I said, I asked for it. Now I got it. And uh, so I went back uh you know, doing my routine, and, and one of the good things that had happened during all of this kind of confusion is I got a uh, offered a regular commission. Now, the difference between the reserve commission that I had at the time and a regular commission is is the government is telling you that, that you're an exceptional officer, and they're going to let you stay at least 30 years if you want to instead of getting out at 20 years like a reserve officer has to. And so I thought that was pretty special. So I, I got to, to get my, my regular commission, and I made captain. And so life was life was pretty good on, on the military side of the, of the deal. 